Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's lovely to see you again on uh, what at the moment is a sunny, cold morning. And uh, I pray that over the next 20 minutes or so, this will be uh, a great time just to lift our eyes to the Lord. Let me read you um, a few verses from Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, So do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Uh, we might say amen to that, um, but uh, the particular bit that uh, I want to mention was the bit where Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. Um, I find that uh, I can only take a certain amount of watching the news at the moment because it seems that the news about tomorrow and when this will end and what's going to happen and what are the timescales uh, constantly seems to get longer time scales further away and uh, I just believe God saying to us look don't worry about that let's spend time focusing on him so this morning we've got a devotion uh, from Paul Lynch and uh, I know that you will enjoy this and be blessed by this we'll follow it up with a worship song and uh, then Afterwards, we'll have a prayer time at the end. If you have things that you would like me to pray for, please put them on Facebook in the message section and I will include them in my prayers. But uh, I really hope you enjoy this uh, word from Paul Lynch this morning. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to bring you God's word today from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, under the heading, Expect the unexpected with Jesus. As a short introduction to the passage, let me mention three things. First of all, weddings were very important within this community. A wedding could last for at least seven days. And depending on the wealth of the family, a whole town could be invited. You even invited people that you didn't like, and it was an insult for them not to come. Weddings were not just about two people coming together. It was about family and community coming together. Secondly, the wedding celebration usually started on the third day, which was a Tuesday, and there was a reason for this. The Jews chose the third day because it was the only day in the six days of God's creation when God looked at his work and he declared, this is good. This is good. And so they believed in the goodness of God on the third day. They believed there was a special blessing of God on the third day. So that's when they got married. The third day was also the day of purification that was set down on the law of Moses. Hence, there were six jars of water at this wedding. Most Jews still get married on the third day, which is a Tuesday. Thirdly, this wedding was significant. Unknown to this young couple, Jesus would perform his first miracle at the wedding, which would be a sign. A sign in scripture calls our attention to something supernatural, to something beyond human ability. A sign also points to a greater reality. There are seven signs in the Gospel of John that I briefly want to mention. John 2, water into wine. John 4, the healing of the official son. John 5, the healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda. John 6, the feeding of the 5,000. John 9, the healing of the man born blind, and John 11, the resurrection of Lazarus. And they all pointed to a greater 
reality. Now, for me, the spiritual significance of this miracle, of this sign, was a foreshadow of God's forgiveness. Jesus takes the water of purification and he turns it into wine. And the wine that Jesus speaks of in Luke 22 at the Last Supper is his blood, which will cleanse us from all sin. The miracle was a sign of what was to come, that those who would drink of his cup, those who would drink of the wine of the kingdom, those who would drink of God's forgiveness would be cleansed forever. Now, let me walk you through this passage and highlight five key factors that makes this story relevant for us today. First of all, notice the host dilemma. Verse 3, when the wine was gone or when the wine had finished. Running out of wine in that culture wasn't just a blunder, it was a major faux pas. The culture was based on honour and shame. And to run out of wine at a wedding was not just inconvenient, it was a loss of reputation, it was a loss of honour and of status within the local community. But what this host didn't know was this, that God was nearer than he thought. God was at the wedding. In these difficult days, we need to remember more than ever that God is nearer than we think. A few days ago, I received a phone call from someone in great distress because of a situation she was in the middle of this storm and she couldn't hear Jesus and she couldn't see him because the wind was so fierce and the waves were so high. But by the time we'd finished talking, by the time we'd finished praying, she realised and recognised that Jesus was nearer than she thought, that Jesus was in the boat, that Jesus was in the storm. Now, I know you know this, but let me remind you. Whatever hardship you face, whatever storm you're in, whatever dilemma is before you, God is nearer than you think. He's in your boat. He's in the storm. And he will get you to the other side. Secondly, notice Mary's expectations in verses 3 to 5. She said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replies. My hour has not yet come. Mary said to the servants, you do whatever he tells you to do. Mary felt deeply for this family. She knew of the shame and the disgrace and the anguish and the humiliation that would follow from this wedding. But her expectation of Jesus is off the radar. She believes that Jesus can and will solve this problem. Now, the response of Jesus to his mother has been the focus of much debate and sermons over many years. Another translation of verse 3 and 4 reads, Dear woman, that's not our problem. My hour has not yet come. Some say that Jesus was harsh to address his mother as a woman. But it's not as cold in the Greek as it is in the English. Woman is a term of respect and affection. Remember when Jesus was on the cross in John chapter 19, with great tenderness, he says, Dear woman, here is your son, as he looks at John. And then he says to John, 
Son, here is your mother. On the face of it, Jesus was reluctant to intervene. He used the words, my hour has not yet come. The word hour in John's Gospel is a term which is used by Jesus constantly to refer to his death. In the framework of the entire Gospel, the word hour, the word time, which is the word koronos in the Greek, it means appointed time. It's not a duration of time. It means an hour. It means a moment. It means a window when something happens. And for Jesus, his Kairos moment would be when the Father is glorified through his death and not through a miracle. In John 17, verse 1, we read, Jesus looked up into heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So in this context, Jesus was not harsh with Mary. He was just focused on his hour of destiny. But Mary's faith and expectation is breathtaking. She expected something to happen. She expected a miracle to happen, and it did. Now, I don't have the theology that we name and claim everything. But I do believe that we should expect great things from God. Paul encouraged the early church to do this when he wrote, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly more above all that we can ask or imagine. Let's be like Mary this year and let's expect the unexpected. Thirdly, notice the servant's obedience, verses 7 and 8. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. This was great advice from Mary. Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. But I wonder what they were thinking when they filled the jars. The guests didn't need more water, they needed more wine, but they did what Jesus asked them to do. There was no ifs, there was no buts, there was no debate, there was no maybes. And here we learn a very important lesson. Obedience always leads to blessing. Remember the story of the widow in 2 Kings 4. She lost her husband, who was a prophet. She was about to lose her two sons and her house because of her debt. But Elisha, the prophet, comes with the word of the Lord. And he says, gather as many jars as you can. Go into your house and start pouring the oil into the jars from your small flask of oil. And when all the jars are full, sell the oil, pay off your debt, and you will have enough to live on. And you know the story well. She did. Things happen when you do what he tells you to do. Blessing always comes through obedience. And as you look back at church history, you will find that great moves of God are usually preceded by small acts of obedience. Do whatever he tells you to do. Fourthly, notice the master's surprise, verses 9 and 10. When the master of the banquet tasted the water 
that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it come from, though the servants who'd drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. The master of the banquet knew a lot about wine. And he's astonished at the quality of this wine. And he wonders where it's come from. And so he says to the bridegroom, why have you kept the best until last? And what should have taken weeks, months and years was done in moments. You know, just one word from the king, just one touch from the king can change everything in moments. For most of us, 2020 has been a very difficult year. And many of us were glad to see the back of it. And as we look into 2021, some of us dare to believe that the best has yet to come. Some of us dare to believe that there is wine that we've never tasted. Some of us dare to believe that he longs to thrill us and surprise us with his provision. He longs to take the ordinary, the water, the flask of oil, the staff, the sling, the stones, the five loaves and two sardines and make them extraordinary in their lives and in his kingdom. And what should take weeks and months and years will be done in moments. In 2021, there will be an acceleration of the purpose of God in our lives and in his kingdom that COVID will not stop. God longs to take our breath away with his provision. Finally, notice the disciples' faith, verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. When the disciples saw his glory, his power, his provision, their faith was strengthened and they were never the same again. At the end of John's Gospel, we read these words. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing in him, you may have life in his name. You see, the more we behold him, the more we become like him. The more we behold him, the more we will live life to the full. The more we behold him, <coughs> excuse me, the stronger our faith will become. And there is a longing in God's heart to bring a fresh revelation of Jesus. There is a longing in God's heart that we might encounter him this year like we've never done before so that we'll be changed from one degree of glory to another. Can I encourage you this year like never before to expect the unexpected with Jesus because he's always nearer than you think. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this passage and how it speaks to us today. We praise you that whatever dilemma we face, whatever storms we find ourselves in, you are nearer than we think. You're always in the storm and you're always in the boat. Help us like Mary to believe that nothing, absolutely nothing, 
is too difficult for you. Help us not to just think outside the box, but help us to believe that there is no box with you. Help us to do whatever you're asking us to do with a willing heart. Help us to recognise that obedience always leads to blessing. Continue to bring a fresh revelation of who you are so that we can grow deeper in you and live life to the full. As we look into 2021, may this be a year when you take our breath away again and again and again. We ask in Jesus' name. Take care, everyone. God bless.
Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, I want to uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, directing our attention to you this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are nearer than we think. I thank you, Father, that you encourage us to expect great things from you. And I thank you, Lord, that when we do what you tell us, things happen. Obedience always brings blessing. Thank you, Jesus, that just one word from you changes things forever. And thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you strengthen us. The more we look at you, the more we spend time with you, the more we become like you. Father, I thank you for the encouragement you gave us through Paul this morning to expect great things from you in 2021, to expect the unexpected. And Lord, I do thank you that your heart is to bring a fresh revelation of Jesus. And Lord, I want to pray for each person watching this today, that you would bring us a fresh revelation of Jesus. And I pray, God, for your church in North Devon, for Grosvenor and for all the other Christian churches in North Devon, that you would bring us a fresh revelation of Jesus. I want to pray, Lord, for our country, for the United Kingdom, Lord, that you would bring in 2021 a fresh revelation of Jesus. And God, I thank you that one touch from you changes things. Lord, how much we need that touch from you in our country and in the world today. Lord, we ask you to come and to move in power. God, I want to pray specifically this morning for Wendy and John Adlam. I pray for Wendy and we lift her up to you as she's going to meet with the doctor and with John at two o'clock this afternoon. I pray, Father God, that you would give them wisdom in that conversation as they make plans for John to come home. And Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on Wendy. And I ask, Lord, you pour your spirit out on Wendy right now. Lord, we pray that you would give her strength to be able to cope, to be able to manage John at home and to look at him, look after him really well. And I do pray again for peace in Wendy's heart. I pray, Lord, that she would sleep well at night. And I pray, Lord, that she would know your strength and enabling through this difficult time. We ask your blessing upon John and Wendy Adlam. And Jesus, I pray now for your blessing upon each one of us, Lord. Uh, Lord, those watching this either live or later on, and those who took part in the items this morning, Lord, we do thank you for them. And we ask for your blessing on each one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that brings us uh, to the end of our daily devotions for this week. Um, we won't be here on Saturday or Sunday. You can see Grosvenor Church service live on Sunday on Facebook starting at 10 o'clock, also on YouTube. Um, James Hyde is going to be preaching um, and we have a number of other items in there <clears throat> as well. Next week, Daily Devotions will be back at 10.30 every morning. On Monday morning, uh, we have another devotion from Yvonne Argyle. And then next week, we've got uh, devotions from Dick Chammings and Craig Mackay and Travis Young, um, among others. So I hope you can join us then. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. And thank you for being with us this morning. Bye.